Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So I'm kind of a, an outlier in this room, although I think Hui Zhang and I, uh, uh, we, we uh, overlap a little bit. But um, uh, what I want to do is talk a, a, about a, uh, what would traditionally have been more of an end-to-end -end capability that I think now is evolving after a very long time of being kind of, of, of stalled in a direction that may bring a really interesting architectural capability to your community for management, um, control of distributed environments and also new kinds of apps um, to the point that, that I think that, that we could uh, potentially see a real revolution occurring with an old technology actually used in a new way and, and uh, opening the door to all sorts of things that people haven't thought much about doing because it just didn't work. So uh, to set the stage for this, and actually I have to say the entire talk and the amount of time I've got is kind of an advertisement for reading some of our papers. but. Um, um, what, what I want to suggest, first of all, is that we should understand our own industry as being very dominated by disruptive change. That, um, there, that one can distinguish, uh, looking at even the talks yesterday and this morning, um, an incremental style of work that tries to make, make progress on, on uh, the next important thing, but in a kind of, a, a, of, of the... Uh, of, of the, I don't want to say the obvious way, but, but a stepwise way. And, and things that happen which really shake the field up. And um, I think when these things happen and really shake the field up, you'd better be awake because sometimes that changes all of the questions very drastically and rather, uh, rather rapidly. I, I think we're hearing about some unpleasant disruptive changes. If I think about the university and, and campus uh, network administrators talking yesterday about things like firewalls not working anymore and the structuring tools we have sort of breaking down and chaos caused by actions at the edge, that, that's a disruptive change of the negative type. The, the disruptive changes that, that interest me of the positive type are technology positionings that are suddenly enabled and are sufficiently far from what we've been used to that they really change the way you build systems. And I think that as researchers, part of our job is to notice these things first and figure out uh, how to make them happen and also how to exploit them. So, so what does it take to have a disruptive change in the networking arena? Uh, first of all, I think you've got, to, you've got to have certain components in place, and if you don't, it's not going to be all that disruptive. So you need a pent-up demand. There needs to be something people are frustrated that they're unable to do, whether they realize it or not. Um, there needs to be an enabler, which is now making it possible to do this thing, whether you've noticed it or not, uh, and, and essentially removing what used to be almost a physical barrier. Uh, and, and it has to be the case that the technology can enable a kind of application which is radically different from anything you've seen before. Um, frequently, there's also a hard technical problem that if you don't solve, uh, you won't be able to take advantage of the technology. And, and the last thing, and I think Microsoft has made this the case, is that these days, even if your technology is great, if it doesn't integrate properly uh, with existing tools, it's going to be useless. And so uh, exploiting uh, new things in the context of old things has become clear. So I'm going to argue that group communication today has these characteristics, and is, or at least is starting to. Uh, obviously, I, I don't mean just the work we're doing at Cornell, but rather that the work we're doing at Cornell is an illustration of why it's time for people to wake up and look at this area again. Uh, group communication, as opposed uh, to PubSub, which has become the uh, kind of buzzword of the moment or eventing in the case of the web services standards. Um, and I want to suggest that it's right here at the edge of the network where, where this is happening, um, that we can overcome these software challenges and that we can do the integration as well. So two seconds on groups, uh, but I want to be quick because I'd rather talk about what we're really doing. This is not a new idea. Groups date way back. Um, when I say groups, uh, I mean something quite similar to what Dave meant in the first talk today. So I'm interested in a, an abstraction, a kind of a container. Uh, it's a container for a set of machines or a set of processes or a set of users, uh, but the users are represented by some sort of a proxy. And so at the end of the day, a group is a set of applications which belong to some kind of a shared structure. Now, uh, if you implement groups, 
uh, they can support various things. Depending on how people have positioned themselves, that hasn't always been true. But uh, I think of groups as a very basic communication abstraction, a bit like IP multicast, but with quality of service properties. And if that's your view, well, you can support replicated data or services. You can put things like publish, subscribe over this. You could call a group a distributed shared memory. You can use a group to do things like leadership selection or coordination abstractions, managing a replicated key, managing policy in a managed network uh, or, or router state. Um, now, uh, these days, uh, again, emphasizing the need to integrate, you would probably say that what a group really is is a type of a distributed object that has a live state associated with it that changes and it triggers events when the changes occur. Um, that you can name this thing in the, in the system namespace, the same one the file systems are named in, uh, and that, that these objects have types uh, and um, that uh, you can think of a class that you take advantage of to, uh, to, to, to be in the group, basically. Um, uh, from a practical point of view, the groups I'm talking about are a lot like files, and you can just open them the way you would open files, and then you're, you're in them if you've got the class that manages the group. Now, now this is uh, already, uh, I have to say, a departure from previous work. Groups first came about in operating systems, but they died out pretty soon after that. Uh, I guess these days you would think of those operating systems as precursors for operating systems for data centers. And there was a sense in which they were very Unix-centric, frankly. Uh, I did a lot of work on adding strong semantics to groups maybe 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, led to a model called virtual synchrony that's related to other strong models, transactions with their ACID guarantees or Paxos. Uh, Microsoft bought Paxos not that long ago, and Leslie Lamport's the leader in that area. Paxos is what's called a strong consensus model. Virtual synchrony is a cheaper uh, uh, but still strong model. Transactions is a more expensive model. Pub sub tends to be the front end of choice. And you like to talk about groups in terms of pictures. This is a virtual synchrony picture. It's a timeline. You've got membership changing, state transferred to a new member, multicast within the group. The guy who wants to send a message just says, I want to change the group's state. Here's the message describing the change. The infrastructure is supposed to get it to exactly the right set of members so that, for example, if somebody in the group makes a checkpoint and I use that to transfer state to someone who's joining, it reflects exactly the multicast sent up to when I joined and all the ones sent after get to me also. That, that's enough to give us a lockstep style of replication. Once you have that, you can easily get consistency. In fact, you get a very strong kind of consistency, which uh, offers fault tolerance properties and in which the group is indistinguishable from a single centralized uh, resource. That's interesting because three or four people this morning talked about wishing that network management was more like a central decision-making authority. These are groups which can make decisions in a decentralized way but mimic a centralized uh, decision-making authority. Virtual synchrony, which is the picture here, is, is quite widely adopted. In fact, uh, I did some work with Microsoft, which was supposed to uh, have ended up in the release candidate for the Longhorn clusters. I got to ask somebody if that really happened or not. They temporarily kicked us out in favor of Paxos, but then a Microsoft University relations rep mentioned to me that, oh no, they kicked out Paxos and put your stuff back in again. So I don't know if I can brag about it or not. Um, there are various uh, models, as I mentioned. I'm not going to linger on this. Um, publish, subscribe uh, tends to have a very, very weak model. You send a message, but you've got no idea if anyone received it. And if you cared, that can be a problem. Many pub subsystems, uh, so you have a topic and a message that you send, you use them because, as a communications sort of uh, a middleware that's very ubiquitous. Your intent was that there was somebody who received this event and acted on it. You might care or want an exception thrown if there wasn't. PubSub tends to be too weak for many apps, and you end up with a lot of grotty end-to-end -end stuff. Uh, it becomes a pain to use, and you're hard, it, it's sort of impractical to layer all that stuff in into the applications. So many people who use PubSub end up with very, very weak architectures, uh, and you don't, don't get all that far. The other three, as I've mentioned, have stronger and stronger semantics. Um, virtual synchrony, the uh, approach I have favored, uh, is fastest and most scalable, but I'm not going to say more about that right now. Um, they've been successful. These things are widely used. Stock exchanges, these are just things that my software from the past are used in. Um, Paxos has been used here at Microsoft for various things. There are also some failures. Now, the f real failure is that the market didn't scale adequately, and um, let me just spend a half second on that. Why didn't the market scale? What went wrong? Well, there turned out to have been two issues. Uh, one was that 
every existing group membership system failed to scale in the sense that you couldn't use groups casually. Uh, you had to be careful, and because of that, they were used mostly for replicating servers, and there aren't that many servers in the world. So your typical licensing opportunity, just as a revenue-making opportunity, if somebody would say, I have a data center with 1,500 machines, so I want to buy your software for three of them. And you'd say, well, that's great. I'd like to charge 10000 a license so I can make a little money. And they'd say, you've got to be kidding. I spend a fraction of that on all of Oracle or all, all of you know, SQL Server. I'll give you 250 bucks a machine. You'll be happy with that. And so you go broke if you tried to sell this stuff. So that caused a market failure. Only a platform vendor could make money on that sort of a world. And frankly, even they decided it wasn't worth the hassle. So IBM, Microsoft, everybody has mechanisms like this buried in their own systems, but not visible to end users. So that was part of the problem. The other problem was that because the technology itself didn't really work in other positionings, you couldn't really use it in any other way where there was a chance to actually get revenue from lots of licenses. All of this caused a collapse of the market. Um, I'll skip this slide because I don't have as much time. Um, so, so here's the answer. I believe that today if we retarget group communication towards the edge, we can overcome every one of these problems, partly because the technology has advanced over a 15-year period and partly because the infrastructure has started to give us the kind of dense, high-quality computational and communication options that we used to have in servers and data centers. Okay? That ties the value to client systems, and it enables all sorts of interesting roles. You could build gaming systems and VR immersion in which apps talk directly to each other, deliver streaming media, stock quotes. You guys would use it for system management and router infrastructures. You could use it for replicating security keys. Uh, you could actually talk about groups in which membership costs you something and you charge people for it. So this is a vision where a client can securely produce or consume data streams. The streams have strong semantics, uh, and servers that are present play a supporting role. So can we overcome the scaling limits? Well, with Quicksilver, um, the, work, well, thanks, no, the work that we're doing now, we think we've succeeded in doing that. This is an architecture scalable in many dimensions at once. Processes can join as many groups as they'd like. Uh, they can subscribe uh, as receivers, but they can also publish in multiple groups. They can transmit to multiple groups. We've uh, experimented with the system, which is implemented, by the way, in .NET uh, C Sharp, because we believe that the settings where there are very large numbers of clients, they are running Windows, realistically. Um, most other group technologies are hosted primarily on Windows. Um, we experimented with churn, failures, loss, perturbations, and what we're finding is that this stuff is very re resilient. Not that it was easy to get there, um, but that's what we've achieved. And we can get extremely high data rates, 10,000 messages a second. We can saturate 100 megabit ether, things like that. We're scaling way better than prior work. Uh, here's a system, uh, here's a, a picture on a log scale in which one of the dominant prior systems, something called J groups, uh, is plotted out against our system, and where we're scaling flat out, uh, and, and running orders of magnitudes faster than they, they top out with just a couple of groups and collapse. The actual performance levels are terrible. Uh, our memory usage goes up slightly if you join thousands of groups, but I can't imagine that people would really join thousands of groups. The key ideas to this system are that it separates dissemination, actually a lot like Dave's ideas. There's a data plane, there's a, a dissemination plane for us, a kind of a control plane, we call that reliability layer. There's a security plane. And these things run side by side concurrently and, and are meshed together. Uh, you don't have to relay multicast to a centralized service, which is one way people have gotten scale. Uh, and we aggregate work across large numbers of groups. So um, it's, a, it's a bit of a work in progress. Um, we're adding things. Today, you can actually download and play with the basic system. Uh, it's running, and, uh, and it's on our website. We're adding an integration into .NET that's going to make groups look like typed files in the file system using shell extensions. Um, we're adding uh, a very strong uh, reliability model, the virtual synchrony model that I mentioned before. At that point, groups are provably indistinguishable from non-replicated data, from individual objects that you're sort of RPCing to. Um, we can support other models, though, and we may go as far as Paxos in perhaps even a transactional model so that if you were, say, a bank, and this particular group's history represented very large trades, that the system would be able to support that as well and persistently store 
uh, the transactional data. We believe we can actually do all of that in one framework quite easily this summer. Uh, and uh, there'll be a security architecture. We're doing this jointly with some people from Stanford, Dan Bonet and uh, John Mitchell. Uh, so uh, to conclude, which I have to, uh, we think that there is an opportunity here that's really pretty substantial. That uh, we can bring people a new programming abstraction that they can use in all sorts of ways. Easy to use, a lot like using files basically, but live files. Incredible performance and that unlike the groups of the past that don't break, when you stress them in the various ways that a, 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 an edge network is going to stress them. Um, I didn't have time to get into that, but the paper that uh, you can download uh, from actually from this conference webpage, among other things, uh, talks about the detailed experiments we've done and shows that this architecture really does scale. It's even uh, mostly immune to broadcast storms, which is one of the reasons people have been hesitant to do these things in the past. So I'll stop at that and take any questions, and hopefully, You'll, you'll be motivated to just peek at the paper, so, which we've submitted to OSDI. I don't know if it'll get in. All right, so. If it doesn't get in, they're idiots, but that's not out of the question. <laughs> that happens all the time. Yeah? Yeah, the, the, the core system is basically delivering data with a single multicast from sender to destination, so you're getting incredibly low de latencies. It's running pretty much at the, at the peak wire rates in the, uh, in the experiments we've done. We don't understand how fast we can make it run because we, our test configuration isn't fast enough, actually, to, to, to hit uh, protocol limits yet. So the question is, if you give people something which lets them exploit the raw technology and it's stable, then you've, you've now enabled quite a few things. Conferencing that doesn't have to relay through some sort of crazy set of servers, uh, management technologies that are very nimble and adapt on the fly. It's that type of... And, and you see classic multicast with lots of state in the, in the routers or single source multicast? Well, our, we're using an unreliable IP multicast for our experiments. You could use a, substitute an unreliable overlay multicast pretty easily. Um, that does require state in the routers, and I think on a wide area, it's unclear you could use th these techniques. You'd have to use uh, higher latency overlay networks. It might not work as well. We're really thinking more of a solution now for edge networks in a corporate LAN or uh, other sorts of uh, dense kind of corporate campus settings as opposed to wide area Internet stuff. I think we could go there in the future, but it would take a bit of work. Ming was asking the same question earlier. Not everything just works automatically in the Internet, and that's not, not, not my goal right this second. But uh, you could conceivably deploy this throughout Cornell Worldwide or Microsoft or someplace like that. Yeah. yeah. Can, do you see where's the sort of a, the best place to have the most you know, impact? Is this the data center that's you know, sort of the, 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 the sweet spot that they used to initially? No, totally not. I, I actually think the chance to have impact is to put this on end-user PCs okay. and support things like VR gaming and other kinds of direct telepresence because I think that that's something we simply haven't had. We haven't had anything like it. So what I'm imagining is a desktop that has a folder that has group endpoints. They could even be live by default and then you'd have a little icon that would see you know, this talk or that talk. You could click them if you wanted them to really run. Um, and uh, where, where uh, apps can consume those just as casually as a browser can. You know, so double click. These days, these days, there's no difference between what a process can do and what a browser can do. So I'm imagining a, basically a live desktop where, where we have coordination and security. And I, I think that's you know, quite an interesting mix that we've never had anything like that, frankly. There were people who tried to use the old group multicast systems as if they supported that, but those systems typically only worked with one group. The minute you tried to use them with a bunch, which would be the logical thing to do sometimes, they'd break. Or if you had a lot of members, they'd break. Um, and they were unstable. They provoked broadcast storms. But now we can finally fix all of these technical problems. And that's why I believe that there's a chance for a 